All right. Hello. I hope everyone had a great week and I'm just waiting for it to show up on YouTube. I know I do this every week, but every week I'm like, this is the week it's not going to work. This is the week it's going to blow up in my face. And it's loading. Excellent. All right. I can see it now. Everything's good. My, my anxiety has quieted down a bit. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about something that I get a lot of questions about, and it is how to come up with unique ideas for projects. So I've been thinking about data science portfolios a lot lately, um, partly because a lot of my friends are on the data science job market. Hello! Welcome, Ryan. Um, a lot of my friends are on the data science job market, and I know many of y'all are too. Um, and it's, you know, it's a big growth field right now. There's lots of job openings, uh, but there's, there's also lots of good guidance for how to put together a portfolio. And then there's some like questionable guidance. And then there's just some, you know, uh, useful knowledge that nobody has, has written down and shared yet. Uh, so one question that I get a lot around, and not just portfolios, I also get, um, a lot of uh, students reaching out to me being like, I need an idea for a project. I'm having a hard time coming up with an idea. Uh, and I thought it would be useful to sort of go through and talk about my, uh, hello, pumping your, rustic, your rusty septic tank. Um, oh, I'm derailed now. Uh, oh, so talking about some ideas for putting together a unique project, something that will really stand out, um, and go through my process for doing it and uh, give you guys some some tips and pointers. Uh, and this is, I also recently asked, ooh, let me sign in, uh, I also recently asked about uh, this on Twitter, what people's, what data science hiring managers pet peeves were about uh, data science portfolios. And one of the things a couple people brought up to me sort of privately uh, was just seeing the same sort of projects over and over again. Uh, and also that's, um, well, maybe it's still active. Uh, I was gonna say whether my, my UW address was still active or not. Maybe it is. I haven't been a student for a bit now though. Uh, what was I saying about projects? and ideas. I think I've said everything I was going to. Uh, and I'm also going to take notes in a kernel just so you guys have something to refer to. And I know I can speak pretty fast. So it's, uh, it's nice to have a, a visual for for what I'm saying. Um, how to come up with unique Hello, Julio. Julio, uh, you're very welcome. Unique ideas for data projects. This is going to be over 60 characters. I guarantee I'm going to click out of here and get a little, yep, 50. Uh, how can we make this shorter? Coming up with unique ideas for projects. Huh? Yes, excellent. Uh, and I'm going to add myself, my um, admin account as a, uh, the what's the word I'm looking for? As a, I'm going to share it with myself. That's the thing. Uh, so that I can, I can edit it from my other account if I need to. Uh, collaborator. That's the word I'm looking for. Add it as a collaborator. And my other account is also under Rachel Tavin. Uh, Rachel Tavin non-admin is very sneaky. You are, and I want to give myself editing privileges. Um, you uh, can't uh, create multiple accounts. It's uh, against the terms of service, but I need a non-admin one so y'all don't have to watch the, watch me working in the development version and stopping to file bugs every five minutes. But if you're entering competitions and you have multiple accounts, we will find out. Okay, um, so there's sort of two, general approaches that I have to coming up with a unique idea for a project. Um, so there are two general approaches I take. So the first one is to take an existing method 
Uh, and this could be something like um, some sort of regression technique or a visualization. I know that's not how you spell visualization. Um, or, um, you know, deep learning, architecture. Maybe that is how you spell visualization. Eh, whatever, it doesn't matter that much. Um, and apply it to a new data set or, yeah, I think that's, that's enough. Um, so taking something that exists and um, that I'm interested in and has, you know, um, a good, um, reason to use it like it's a solid method like I wouldn't um, if you're working with sort of deep learning or neural nets I wouldn't necessarily take something from say the 90s or the 80s and uh, try to apply it uh, but something that, that would be exciting and then showing that you can extend it to um, a new uh, you know extend it to a new, new type of type of data and a new problem uh, and the other thing that I, this one personally for me is much more exciting, is use a technique in a new way, also with a new data set. Um, so you will notice that the thing that's the same here is new data sets. Um, one of the tech pet peeves that somebody brought up to me specifically was projects on MNIST. Um, so things on super common data sets. Uh, it looks a little bit like student work, even if it's not, because a lot of teachers will use these, you know, um, canonical data sets in teaching. And I mean, I do it when I teach. I use Iris a lot. That's one of the, the favorite R ones for things like regression or clustering, um, because they know them inside and out, and there's a lot of help available online. Um, and that's great for learning, but then when you're putting together a portfolio, what you're really showing off is you can do the job, right? Um, putting together a portfolio is something you do, you know, towards the end of your your learning cycle when you're you're showing that you can work independently and you've developed sort of like the confidence um to to really go out on your own and and try new things and you're showing off that you have those skills uh, so you maybe want to stick clear of uh sometimes. sorry i i know i'm a little bit scattered today i didn't have my my afternoon coffee that I usually have and I'm feeling it a little bit. Uh, so steer, is that the cow or the steering? I think that one's not the cattle one. I think that's the one about going in directions. Uh, steer clear of very common data sets, uh, e.g. anything from the UCI data repository. Um, so if you're not familiar with it, UCI has a lot of data sets and we have a lot of them as well mirrored that are you know under public domain and really good for uh, demonstrating techniques. Ah, uh, oh, thank you, pumping your rusty septic tank. Uh, so UCI has a lot of data sets that are um, really good for beginners, uh, but not necessarily good for showing, you know, you're just showing off a little bit. That's what you're doing in a portfolio. You're really just like, oh, look at me. I did something really cool. Don't you want to hire me? Because I'm great and I have good ideas. Um, and this is taking a while to load. Uh, what if instead of hotness, I search by, mm, nope, not that one. Most votes maybe? Uh, I'm trying to look for one that's from from UCI. I think this is actually a, a copy of a UCI data set. Um, the, the wine reviews, um, or like, here we go. Um, Iris, the UCI machine learning data sets. Again, great data sets, nothing against them. I use them all the time. They're great for testing. They're great for sort of small projects. Not so good when you really want to um, show off your chops. Uh, oh, let me actually do my mark down correctly uh, and we're just going to pretend that everything's spelled correctly repository there we go um yeah uh the other thing that i 
wanted to bring up, uh, and I'm, gonna, I'm just going to remember stuff all throughout the stream. Um, I'm working on putting together a talk and probably a blog post on this topic, but I'm still sort of in the, I've got a lot of great ideas and I want to make sure that I get them all in their stage. So this is going to be maybe a little bit less structured. And I also want people to, to ask questions. So if you have questions, please feel free to ask them. It's what I'm here for. Um, but another pet peeve that a hiring manager brought up with me is it's fine to uh, reuse someone else's code, but make sure you know what it does. Um, so, oh, hi, Ashley. Akshay, sorry, did a little metathesis, metathesis right there. Uh, you're very welcome. So they, the, this, this hiring manager told me a story about someone who had a really interesting project um, and they were asking them um, like details about like, oh, um, what does, you know, this function do? And the person was like, I don't know, I just copied and pasted it or it was just something I imported from a library and I don't know what it actually does. Um, and again, that's fine when you're a student and you're sort of like figuring things out. Um, like when I was uh, starting to learn R, for example, I had no idea what apply did. I just, I didn't know what the, like the one or two thing, like the second argument did. I had no idea what that meant. I was literally just like copying and pasting, pasting from Stack Overflow and like trying things until I got it to work. Um, which again, that's fine. That's how you learn. You don't have to know everything when you're a beginner, but when you're, when you're trying to show that you're a professional and that you have a really deep knowledge in these topics, you do want to make sure you're not including something in your, uh, you're not including something in your portfolio where there's a big chunk of it and you're not sure what's happening there. That doesn't reflect on you super well. Um, but that might be a good way for you to really reflect on the things that you need to work on. So for me, um, my my biggest personal challenge right now is data structures in Python. Uh, some of them are, some of them are getting there, but I'm very used to working with uh, vectors in all their many shapes and forms, and many data structures in Python are just not that. Um, so it's it's been a learning curve for me. And I, for example, I would not uh, put a project in my in my portfolio right now that relied on a lot of sort of like manipulation of data structures and a lot of sort of like, I don't know, um, I'm, I'm thinking of dictionaries right now, uh, wouldn't rely really heavily on default dicks because as I discovered uh, over the past three weeks as you guys were, were joining me, uh, it's, a, it's an area for improvement for me. And that's fine, it's just in a portfolio, you wanna, you wanna show off what you're good at. I think that's also a good tip. Uh, hi, light your strengths. Uh, and everyone's gonna bring something that they know a lot about. Um, so maybe you've got domain knowledge, uh, and this is something that personally I have, you know, I built my, uh, uh, Ryan said your named entity recognition kernel is almost there. Nah. <laughs> I don't know as I'd put that in my portfolio. I don't know as I'd highlight that. Um, I don't know. I might. If I didn't have anything else graph based, I might do that. But um, and if you guys didn't uh, don't know what he's talking about, this is something that I worked on on the stream for the past couple weeks. Uh, so domain knowledge is something that I have as a as a as a strength as a data scientist. I know a lot about language. I know a lot about um, visual language, spoken languages, written languages. I have a PhD in linguistics. Like that's very much a thing that I know about. So when I was putting together my portfolio um, for for applying to jobs after grad school, I highlighted my language in my NLP work because that's something I knew a lot about. Um, did I include a vision project? No. <laughs> Would I now if I was looking for a job? Yeah, probably. I'd want to show that I had, you know, more breadth. Um, but I'm not on the market right now, so I, I haven't. Uh, I've sort of let my, my portfolio sort of, what's the word I'm looking for? Not squander, not launder. Not sonder. Oh my gosh, what's the word? Languish. Wow, that wasn't close to any of those other words. I've let my portfolio languish a bit. Uh, and maybe that will be my next series of streams, will be me gussing up my portfolio a little bit. Uh, so domain knowledge might be something that you have a lot of depth in. Um, maybe uh, clear technical writing. 
Uh, maybe you sort of really are good at explaining technical concepts and you, as part of your portfolio, maybe you have like a teaching project where you're like, oh, uh, I have noticed that some people like me have been struggling with default dictionaries. Uh, in this portfolio piece, I talk about them in depth and I explain them. Uh, and if you, if you have sort of a teaching project in your portfolio, you show that you know the thing really well, because it's hard to, it's hard to teach things you don't know very well. Uh, but you also show that you can communicate well, and that's a key, a key skill. Um, I know, I know it's so like cliche that like, oh, communicate well, oh, good communication skills, but it really is important. Uh, and your your teachers throughout your entire educational career were not lying to you. Uh, the scoff skills do in fact count and people value them and they will make you your life easier for having them and also your coworkers' lives easier. Uh, oh, or um, maybe you're super good at visualization. Maybe you've got just like an amazing eye for what's gonna make a super good data visualization. Um, so highlight that. Uh, and, and, you know, bring it out and maybe try and find a job post that's going to play to your strengths. Uh, and if you don't know what your strengths are yet, if you've, I don't know, if you've done a lot of sort of work by yourself and not as much, um, you know, not as much communication with other data scientists, especially if you're doing some self-study, you may not know what your specific strengths are. Um, so if you don't know what you're better at than other people, um, Include projects you're really excited about, right? Um, oh, now I'm talking about portfolio development again uh, and not coming up with ideas for projects. So I'm just going to get rid of that. Uh, I'm going to rephrase that. Find a project you're excited about. Uh, and this is also going to keep you going, right? If you're building something that you're going to use and that you think is really cool, then when you run into your 50th bug and, oh my God, you can't get the data out of this database um, and you just are, are frustrated and struggling, then the excitement for the project is going to help you carry through. And if you, it's a project that you're sort of like, meh, to begin with, um, you're going to lose motivation, especially if you're, you know, you're trying to put together a portfolio on nights and weekends or you've got kids or um, there's a there's like a hundred thousand things that uh, are, are more fun to do than putting together a, a portfolio. Um, well, I mean, it's work, right? It's showing your work, so it, it is work and it probably is gonna feel like work. So if you find something you're excited about, um, uh, maybe you're really into video games and you do some sort of video game analysis, that's fun. And then when you talk about it later, you know, you'll be excited to talk about it. Uh, okay, so let's, go through and I'm going to come up with an idea for a project. Uh, I have not studied this. Uh, I haven't sort of thought about it at all. Uh, so I like to start with a data set uh, and I'm just gonna go to the data sets listing on Kaggle. Uh, and you obviously you don't have to use Kaggle. Uh, Google just launched a new a new data set search service. Um, but I mean, I'm this is a Kaggle stream, so we're gonna use Kaggle. Uh, and oh, you might have noticed we just hit 10k data sets. Uh, so that's exciting. Oh, there was a different there was a larger number of versions, so people who had updated data sets. So very exciting. Um, yeah, so I have sorted these by updated. So these are the ones that are, uh, uh, have been most recently changed. And these are likely gonna be the ones that aren't going to have as many analyses on them. So this little, um, oops, I clicked. I clicked instead of hovering. Uh, so there's a little symbol uh, that shows you how many analyses are, ah, beans, and now it's resorted them. So, <laughs> There's a, a little symbol that shows you how many analyses have been uh, done on the data set. And I would recommend finding something that doesn't have a lot of analyses on it. Um, so maybe not this fast food habit. It doesn't have a picture, so it might not be the most interesting data set. It doesn't have any upvotes. I don't know, we can take a look. Uh, it, might be, it might be a really good one. Uh, but this one, this one has, you know, it's got a picture, it's got a subtitle, uh, there's only one kernel, only six people have looked at it. Probably no one's working on a big project on this data set. We could do something new and interesting on it. So I'm gonna open that up uh, and I'm gonna write down what I'm doing. 
I like to go to the data sets listing and sort by recently updated. Then pick one without a lot of analyses on it. Uh, and again, this avoids the sort of like, oh, I've seen this project 20 times sort of problem. It's, it's going to be something new and fresh. Um, so let's check this the data set out. It doesn't have a description. All right, that's not going to be a great one for me, probably. Um, Rudal says, what's the name for the new Google data set search stream? It is, I think it's just Google data set search. Yeah, uh, it's, uh, I'll copy and paste this into the notebook so you guys can have access to it later. Uh, And I'll make this public at the end so you guys can, can check it out. Um, and this also indexes uh, Kaggle data sets as well uh, because we use the, so it, it index any data set that uses the schema.org metadata uh, specification for storing the metadata, which is just sort of an international standard. Um, and we happen to use it, so our data sets show up. Um, it's not like some secretive cabal collusion thing, it's just how your, how your backend set up. Um, Oh, so if we search something like Boston Education data, um, you can see that there's a, a Kaggle data set there, but there's also data sets from ProPublica. Um, there, I would watch out for ProPublica just because their usage license can sometimes be a little bit restrictive, so make sure you read it. Uh, they've got great data sets, really fabulous resource. Just be aware. You definitely don't want to have a project in your portfolio that is violating the data license. Uh, that's not a good look. Don't do that. Uh, CPSR, uh, I don't know what this is, but it's from Open Data License Commons uh, from Antarctica. I don't know as I trust this metadata, because Massachusetts is not in Antarctica. Anyway, I'm getting sidetracked. Uh, but yes, that is the, the data sets. Uh, and this is, actually, this might be a better... Uh, sample project uh, and so the the little um, notification here means that there's five things that the original data author hasn't done uh, original data set author doesn't done so this might actually be a really interesting data set for us to do a project on um, so looking at it uh, you can see uh, there's times there's age groups there's gender uh, there's sort of information on person personality. Uh, there's uh, location information, so where they live. There's uh, information on how often they eat fast food. Let me put it this way. So, oh, this will also let us see if there's any missing data. Um, so I just click this little half and half one here. Um, yeah, and then there's some information that looks like on, on purchasing habits, pizza, small chops shawarma. Um, so this might be uh, a good sort of like market analysis data set to, to show your chops on. So um, things that I would ask of a data set like this. So we have some information on demographics. I might ask questions about, um, let's say, which age group uh, buys the most uh, Nigerian dishes or burgers um, and sort of look at the distribution of the different um, uh, the distribution of the different preferences across age groups because that might tell you something like oh uh, younger people really like Nigerian food or oh older people really like shawarma and that could be um, really useful information if you have like a shawarma place um, and you know that a lot of your customers are older and so you could either sort of like play to your strength or maybe you try to rebrand to get in the younger customers to eat more shawarma so you have like a cartoon mascot I guess to get kids excited about shawarma I, I guess kids are excited about shawarma I like shawarma uh, I'm not a kid but um, so uh, that sort of analysis and then I would also write um, not like a not like a novel around it but like a story around it so um that that example that i talk about like oh well 
um, if you, you know, depending on what you find, uh, if you find that, oh, the, um, there is this distribution or um, there's not a lot of women buying pizza or something, um, then that tells you about sort of the, the market uh, and sort of telling this marketing story, uh, which shows that you are thinking about commercial applications of the analysis. Uh, the type of techniques I'd use here, I think I'd start with just visualization. And when I'm putting together a portfolio, um, I would probably only have, I do a lot of visualization and exploratory data analysis, but then I would only have um, maybe three or four plots in the final project that really show the key point of whatever I'm trying to show. Um, so think about it like putting together a slide, uh, slide deck, right? You wanna have just the slides that have really like a lot of information at once. Um, or, or the most important information in sort of like a, a concise, packed way, rather than having like 80 slides. If you have 80 slides, nobody's gonna remember anything. If you have six slides and they're all like really interesting and dense, maybe you will remember one of them. People don't remember slides very well. Uh, so that's sort of the, the thing that I do there. Um, I might do, what's one of the things? Uh, so there's also information on specific uh, places. Uh, oh, and there would also need to be some data cleaning here because it looks like this is something where you can choose multiple options and some people have chosen multiple options. Um, so this might be a really good place to um, uh, highlight your statistical knowledge. So this is a classic statistics problem. You know, 18 people are taking calculus, 19 people are taking uh, linear algebra, 10 people are taking calculus and linear algebra. How many people are not taking both classes, right? That sort of very, very classic statistics question. Um, you could you could show off your ability to reason about groups in that way. Um, you could also show off data cleaning because this is gonna need a little bit of munging. Um, I would probably, I would probably change, um, have different columns for each of these. So I'd have a data set that would be like, a sub data set that would be maybe, um, pizza places and then uh, I would have each pizza place as a separate column and then uh, I would have you know a one if the person said that they used it and then a zero if they didn't and then each row would be a, se a separate person so I'd show my ability to sort of reason about data structures in that way um, yeah and I'm, again I'm just sort of like sitting here looking at it thinking about what I do um, which I mean also is going to be when you have like a data set in a project the thing that you did is gonna be compared against the thing that the person would have done. Um, if you've ever sort of presented an analysis project, um, if people get excited about it, at the end of it, they're like, oh, well, what about group A? Did they, you know, eat the pickles too? Um, and they'll have a lot of sort of like spin-off questions. Um, so the that's good. <laughs> like you get a lot of spin-off questions. What's bad is like, well, why didn't you look at blah, 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 blah. Um, something that the other person thinks is really obvious and that you didn't do. And that can be, that's just hard. That's just hard to get to get feedback on. Um, if you have like like friends who do data science, um, I would have them maybe take a look at some of your portfolio projects uh, and get some feedback that way. Um, yeah. If you're a student, have your, have your advisor or, or a professor uh, uh, have a, you know, um, uh, like tutor mentor feedback. Uh, <laughs> I love these. I love these little like a jollof warrior, a shawarma expert, a pizza connoisseur, small child supremacist. I love these little like titles. I wonder if these are like common expressions in Nigeria. I've never been to Nigeria, so I have no idea. Um, if any of you are Nigerian, maybe you can you can let me know, or maybe it's just like a cute thing that they did in the survey. Yeah, uh, so I think I'm trying to, to, to put this down. Um, look over the data set and think about what questions. Um, actually, I think this is gonna be several under bullet points. Uh, you could answer with this. Um, if it, were data from someone's business, what would they want to know about it? 
Um, Cause I mean, the, the hard truth of the matter is unless you are working in a lab as sort of a, a researcher um, and you're trying to get hired as a data scientist, you're going to end up, you know, working for a company that wants to make money. Uh, so if you can think about, you know, commercial ramifications and, and show off that knowledge and that show that you were, that it's something that you're thinking about. Um, if you have a business background, this is a good place to apply it. Uh, then that's, you know, that can be compelling for, for managers, especially if they're not data scientists, which a lot of times um, people will be the only data scientist or they'll be in a very small team of data scientists in, in a company and in a management structure that does not have any other data scientists in it. Um, what needs to be done to the data before you can analyze it? data cleaning uh, can you show off your ability to handle uh, tricky problems I wouldn't necessarily show all data cleaning in a um, portfolio project I would show just the um, the really tricky ones so like if there's you know if some of the in this data set if like Sometimes likely is uppercase and sometimes it's lowercase and you go through and you fix that. I wouldn't mention that. But uh, this sort of interesting thing where sometimes multiple answers are in the same the same text field, that I might show up. I think that shows some like, um, you'd have to do a little bit of text processing here to break these into multiple things. You do have to do some like manipulation of the data structure. So that I might show off. Uh... Uh, another thing you might do is you might look at similar um, similar data sets. So so I think we still. I'm trying to remember, I know at one point we suggested other data sets uh, if you are looking at a data set and uh, did we get rid of that? No discussion, no activity. Yeah, either we got rid of it or I can't find it right now, but at some point we definitely had this. Um, so let's try looking for other data sets that are similar to this data set. Um, so it's, it talks about fast food and that's what the topic is, but I think that I'm more interested in sort of the market survey aspect of this. Um, so let's, uh, kernels, let's look at the right tab first. That's going to be important. And in data sets, let's look at marketing and then survey and see if we can find anything else that's sort of in that, um, you know, range of things. Uh, so, and here it's by relevance. I think relevance is the only way you can track, uh, you can sort search results. It is not. You can sort search results in other ways now. Excellent. That's fairly new. Uh, that's a nice update. I am pleased by this. Uh, so we're looking for marketing surveys. Uh, that's not going to be helpful. Uh, I think this is information on um, what's been sold, so not like people's perceptions. Um, betting information. And I'm just sort of, you know, scrolling to try and find something similar. Oh, here we go. A customer survey. So this is going to be probably fairly, fairly similar, and we could ask similar types of questions. Uh, and let's see. Uh, so a yearly comprehensive survey of our guests to gauge satisfaction. Uh, so not not exactly the same type of data, but relatively similar. Oh, woof. Maybe not, actually. Uh, is there a data dictionary? There's a data dictionary. Ugh. Um, so usually this type of... I don't know what discipline does it, but every so often... I say every so often. A lot of... Um, like, especially a lot of government data, a lot of data from, like 
older institutions and organizations will do this thing where they have data sets that have super duper opaque names. And instead of making good names, look at this, this has spaces in it. Um, and instead of making good names, they will uh, give you a dictionary of what's in the names. Uh, and this might be having to work on maybe an older computer system that has limits on, on what sort of characters you can put in the name. I don't know. Um, but the point was that I was going to look for a kernel and see, well, there's a starter kernel. Uh, so no one has, has answered this, uh, has, has analyzed this, but this would also be uh, a good data set to, to use because no one, a, no one's used it. Uh, and B, this is very clearly something that has a commercial application. Everybody has customer surveys. They want to know how, how people are feeling about it. Uh, I mean, we have customer surveys if you've uh, ever gotten our, our hats email. Uh, Destmark. I don't know what that means. Um, yeah, also everything's numbers. Nope, not everything. Many things are numbers. So this might be this might be from a database that can really only support a limited number of oh, they have this thing where the question well, things in this column have to do with question five, and you have to go and look up what question five is. Um, but this might be a good place to show that you can handle the sort of um unuser friendly sort of data. Uh, maybe you could use OCR, um, optical character recognition, to automatically extract the information from the PDF and then use that to uh, transform the data so that the column names were more informative. Um, that's a piece of um, data analysis that I would definitely show off in a portfolio because you're showing a little bit of computer vision, you're showing you know, knowledge of, um, I, don't, I don't know how doable it would be, probably not very, but um, yeah, no, that would be a hard but useful project. Um, yeah, so coming back to my thing, um, I did not succeed <laughs> at looking at analysis of similar types of data. Uh, and then for, so the, the next thing I would do is I would do data exploration slash uh, I'm just going to say exploratory, exploratory data analysis. So that would be my next step would just be to load in the data, make some charts, ask some questions. Um, and then five, find the most interesting thing in the analysis and expand on it. So maybe it's, um, maybe you're doing an analysis of New York and you find out that one of the neighborhoods behaves very differently. Um, and that's the interesting thing. And so then I might talk about that neighborhood. Maybe I'd get uh, more information about that neighborhood, maybe demographics, maybe income information, maybe, um, I don't know, pet licenses, um, whatever might help explain whatever the, the surprising behavior is um, on it, including other related data sets. Uh, using multiple data sets is good because it shows that you can um, work with multiple sources, that you're, you're resourceful, you're looking for things. And again, it's going to make your project more unique because maybe somebody uses the one data set you do, but they're probably not going to use all six of them if you're using a lot of data sets to build this story. Um, build your story around the interesting finding, making sure to answer the question, so what, why is this important? Um, and this is, the last part is I think one of the things that graduate school prepares you for. Um, I'm not suggesting anyone goes to graduate school. I'm going to give you guys the advice I give everyone who asks me, which is don't go to graduate school. Um, but the sort of thinking about um, your work and your project in terms of a larger context. So why is it important? Uh, if the data is from somebody who is paying you, then it is important because they want to be able to make business decisions based on your analysis. So think about what sort of business decisions you might make. So um, I, I gave some examples with maybe marketing, um, 
I'm trying to come up with another good example. Uh, so maybe you find you're doing an analysis of tree cover and you find that um, conifer trees in uh, Washington state, the cover has gone down 10% in 20 years. Um, why is that important? Well, maybe some of those conifers were Christmas trees and this means there's fewer Christmas trees, but more people want them. So maybe Christmas trees are going to become more expensive and you should invest in them. I don't know that that's true. Um, I do know that there's a lot of Christmas tree farms in Washington state. So going from this sort of like, oh, that's sort of interesting uh, finding about um, the conifer tree cover and then taking that and building a story. And you like, I say story to show that I want there to be like a, um, a clear flow of information and I want people to sort of come along with me as I'm telling them things uh, and not that I'm making something up. Like don't make something up unless you're like, this is a story, this analysis is about unicorn returns in the Elfland forest or whatever. Make it very clear that you're making up. Don't, don't do sort of like a half made up project. That's, that's weird. Um, I would recommend against that. Um, yeah. So that's sort of how I would, uh, oh, actually, um, so this is sort of more of a storytelling and another option. Uh, so you could either sort of build your story around a project in a way that's new, or uh, the other option is to find a technique that is usually applied to this sort of problem and apply it. Uh, and I would also recommend uh, include some text introducing the technique and why you chose it. Um, so don't just say like, oh, k-means is a clustering algorithm. Um, you also say k-means is a clustering algorithm and I chose it because this is an unlabeled data set and I want to know um, which groups of users are more like each other. That sort of thing. Um, yeah, so I'm just gonna take a pause and I know I've been talking a lot. Um, open it up to questions because I hope people have questions. Let me rephrase that. What questions do you guys have? Because I can absolutely keep talking, but um, I'm also very interested to hear, you know, what you guys are worried about, what you're interested in, um, what's confusing. And I know that there's a little bit of lag on the stream, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna wait for that. Hmm. Moodle says, off topic, not at all, but what kind of self projects do you think would attract attention from top companies if you're looking to land a role in their data science slash analytics team? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. It depends on the company. Um, so I would say something that is relevant to their work. Um, so if I were, say, uh, really interested in working at Facebook, um, you know that they do a lot of social networks stuff. Uh, that's sort of one of their, their core thing. Um, and I mean that in the in the graph theory way and not in the, the Facebook sort of way. I like their Facebook. Um, I mean, data analysis techniques around networks. Um, so I would probably do some sort of networks analysis, some sort of uh, uh, maybe social behavior or propagation analysis, um, maybe something with, uh, I don't know, I'm just trying to come up with, with cool networks ideas. Uh, well, actually, let's find data. Let's find uh, a networks data and talk about what I would do if I were trying to, to get a job at Facebook. And I just picked one off the top of my head. Um, Let's see, this should be, if I go back one more, it should be on the data sets listing, right?
let's do it that way. Um, yeah, so I would think about the things that the company is likely to be interested in. And if you don't know what things that they are interested, that they are likely to be interested in, and you're not sort of, maybe you're familiar with their, their business model, but you don't know. Uh, actually, I think we have a networks tag. It might also be under graphs. Um, if you are interested in demographics, that's something that Facebook would be interested in. Um, their their product, you sort of know about their the commercial side, but you don't know a lot about what their day to day is. Um, maybe try reaching out to um, maybe contacts you know at that company if you have any, um, and see if you can get an introduction to some of their data scientists or analytics people uh, and get a better idea about what sort of things that they care about. Um, I would also recommend reading their white papers if they have any. So these are sort of like papers that talk about an interesting technique that they've developed uh, and maybe try applying uh, a technique that they've developed to a new sort of uh, data set. So if I just wanted to look up Facebook white papers and I do see that there's another question that I will get to in just a second. Um, yeah, so uh, Facebook, and, and again, this is true of all large tech companies. I just sort of picked the first one that I could think of because uh, I have Facebook on my phone and I got a notification. Uh, you can see that they're doing a lot of things in a lot of different spaces. Um, so if I looked at a data science project, maybe take one of their techniques and apply it to a new model. All right, uh, Julio, and then I'll get to Sam. Uh, maybe newbie question, should I focus on, oh, wow, I don't know why the chat is so small for me. Uh, should I focus on one programming language for data science or is it better to dominate more than one? I mean, I'm more oriented to use Python than R, for example. That's a good question. Um, I use both. Um, I tend to prefer R for things like graphing and working with tabular data. It depends. If you really have your heart set on a machine learning engineering role, then I'd stick with Python. If you're thinking about doing any sort of analytics, then I would also know R, um, especially the statistics literature and, and techniques that are released are gonna be released as R packages and not as Python packages. So if you're trying to keep on top of statistics, um, I would I would stick with R. I don't know, it's good to use, it's good to know both. Um, Certainly on the software engineering side, if you only know one programming language, that's considered sort of a red flag for anyone who's not just out of school. Um, so I would get good at one and get really fluent and be able to code without, you know, just do basic tasks without looking anything up so you're prepared for technical interviews, uh, but know about and how to use the other. Um, and that can be sort of like your, you know, your nice to have, yeah. Uh, hopefully that, that answered. I know there's, there's a lot of discussion about the whole R Python thing out there. Uh, and I, again, I'm an R apologist. All right. Uh, Sam says, how do I go past creating a novel notebook slash model and learning data science, deploying models to production in a reproducible fashion, Docker slash K8 monitoring, retraining, data versioning, automated unit testing with Jenkins or something, that type of stuff. Recently reading the TFX paper from Google, there's just so much more data science than notebooks, it seems. Uh, definitely, yeah. That is a good question. Um, not every role is going to have you do all of those things. So it'll, it'll depend on where you're working. It'll depend on the type of team you're doing. There are some places where, yes, all you need is notebooks. Um, and actually, uh, sort of funny, Netflix, uh, only uses notebooks for their whole sort of data science pipeline, but they do a lot of sort of um, uh, data flow through the notebooks. Um, so a notebook is just like a uh, a little immutable unit that does one thing and then you you call it from different places. So you can get pretty far with notebooks is sort of the, the point there. Um, but yes, my uh, suggestion there would be to build a sample project. Um, and this is something that I might have something in the works for as well, um, because there's, um, yeah, I, I can't talk about it too much. I'm very excited. Um, hopefully coming soon, TM, we will be talking about, uh, not just talking about doing something that's a little bit more oriented towards putting code into production. Um, 
oh, I will tell you, I don't put code into production. I am a data scientist and not a software engineer. Um, yeah, I would build sample projects is probably the the best suggestion I have there. Uh, and if you really want to show that you can sort of like handle the whole pipeline, um, maybe like a dashboards project would be my recommendation. So maybe some sort of public data API um, taking the data, doing the data munging and manipulation, uh, and then updating a live dashboard uh, would be, I think, a good project to show that you have sort of that, that thing. Um, I'm doing a quick think through to think of all the data scientists I know and work with, how many do their own unit testing? Uh, maybe about half. I don't usually do unit testing, but I'm mostly doing one-off stuff uh, again, and I, I don't push code to prod, so yeah, uh, agree. That's definitely harder to do that infrastructure stuff. All right, uh, Patrick says, how much time do you normally spend on each project? Uh, well, if we're taking the mean, like three years, <laughs> uh, because I did do a dissertation, um, which again, don't recommend to the, the vast majority of, of people on earth. It's there are other things that will make you happier with that same amount of time. Um, that's a really good question. Uh, I know there's a lot of people who are like, oh, you should always be working and always like have something on a simmer. Um, I would say if you are comfortable with data science, um, I would try not to spend, like if you're, if you're, you know, you're ready to sort of do this professionally, um, I would actually try not to spend too much time on a project. Um, maybe five hours, uh, just because you don't, you don't necessarily need to have the biggest, hugest, most complex thing ever. Uh, and if you spend a lot of time on it, then you're gonna get burnt out and tired. And presumably if you're on the job market, you're also doing technical interviews. Um, so yeah, and I mean, you can also do sort of like minimum viable product models. So you have like your project and then like, you've done enough of it that you can show people and then you can continue to work on it and iterate and prove it over time. But I wouldn't be like, you need 10 projects and you need to spend 20 hours on each and you need to spend 400 hours studying data science. I don't, I think that that's sort of mm, working yourself to the bone mindset is really unhealthy. So, all right. Uh, Ryan says, any tips for scraping your own data sets? Finding data to scrape, licensing, scraping, storing, etc., or just stick with Kaggle sets for now? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so I know that there's, there's this like five, 15 questions in one, which is why I'm pausing so long. Um, so if you are gonna do scraping, um, be polite about it. Make sure that you're not trying, that you're not gonna crash a site, that you're you are rate limiting yourself, that you're doing requests. And actually in R, there's a, um, package called polite that you can use to help with this. Um, ah, there we go. Or maybe it's politeness. Uh, oh, nope, this isn't it. I think the package is just called polite. Oh, I know him. Uh, and Cynthia. Uh, nope, that's not it. I think the package is just called polite. I don't think it's called politeness. There we go. This one. Um, so this will help you uh, be, you know, just follow etiquette online so you're not like, again, crashing websites. Um, I know a lot of people like, what's it called? There's a Python package a lot of people use. I want to say it's called Beautiful Soup, but I don't think that's it. Um, and Beautiful Soup is a package, but I don't think that's the one everyone always talks about. It's like, it's not Spinnaker, that's something different. I've forgotten the name. Um, yeah, do make sure that you check the license of the data, uh, check the, um, you know, the data set you're scraping from to make sure that you are following their licenses. Again, don't include like projects where you're doing something illegal in your portfolio. That's not great. Yeah. Um, hopefully that's helpful. Scrapey, that's exactly the one. Thank you. Um, yes, that's the one I was talking about. Yeah, I think those are the tips I have off the top of my head. I don't do a whole ton of scraping. Um, mostly I'll, I'll use APIs to get data that I want. Um, yeah. All right, Sam, 
Uh, I've got another one. Any advice on searching for companies for that first job? Some companies don't know what they want from data science. Others don't have the resources to mentor slash train their way careers. Uh, sort of the sweet spot of places that have well-oiled data science machines like Google, etc., but don't require a PhD slash five plus years of data science to, to get into. Yeah. That's a really good question. Um, so it depends where you are physically. Um, it also sort of depends on what, what type of person you are. Uh, so the, the advice that I think everyone will tell you is to intern, which I absolutely understand is not a problem, is not like an option for everybody, especially unpaid internship, which is exploitation and don't accept an unpaid internship. Um, don't do it. Uh, yeah, so I think my probably, my number one piece of advice would be to uh, network locally with other data scientists that are where you are, assuming you want to work in person, because you'll get a good feel for which data science companies, well, A, you'll know if there's another data scientist at the company. Um, I, especially for early career, it can be very rough to be the only data scientist at a company because you're not going to have a mentor who understands, you know, the technical um, uh, nature of your work. Uh, and I haven't been in this position, but I have a lot of friends who have been, and it's it's been extremely stressful for them. Um, and I think the right towards sort of person can thrive in that environment, but you have to be comfortable doing everything and having sort of minimal support and having stakeholders who don't really understand what you're doing, but do expect that you just give them a pony every day. Um, so that, that might be a better type of post for a mid slash, you know, more mid career slash more advanced, more, more experienced data scientist. Um, I've had a lot of friends who have had a lot of luck with sort of mid stage startups. Uh, generally younger companies are, let me rephrase that. Many companies that are really focused on data science and know how to do data science good and are, are really excited about it are going to be um, slightly younger companies. Um, so, I mean, here in here in Seattle, I'm thinking of like Textio off the top of my head. Um, I know it has like a really great mentoring and support system and they're sort of a, a mid-sized slash largest startup. Um, yeah, so so networking, um, and you that way you'll also know who's hiring. Um, and if you're if you're just like chatting with someone, it's like completely, like completely normal to be like, oh man, your team sounds great. Are you guys planning on having any positionings opening up? Um, I noticed that you you talk about doing a lot of I don't know NLP. I have a background in NLP. Uh, I I'd, I'd love to learn more about your company and just like keep me in mind. Um, yeah, you might have a luck with data science recruiters. There's a lot of them. Uh, you might. I don't know. I've had sort of mixed experience with mixed experiences with recruiters. So, yeah. Um, and my other big piece of advice: if you are the type of person that finds this enjoyable and not like hell on earth, if you can do public speaking and it's something that you know. Uh, doesn't destroy you from the inside, which I absolutely know is something for some people. Um, then maybe think about doing some some public some uh, public public speaking around technical talk. So maybe meetups if you have any in the area. Um, and then you know at the end of your talk, be like, and also by the way, you can hire me. <laughs> My talk was great. Wouldn't you love me to work for you? Um, yeah. Good luck. Stay on that grind. All right, we got about three minutes. Any other questions? I know, I, job, fresh, job seeking is just, it's rough. It's rough emotionally. It can be rough physically. Um, and just like be nice to yourself and give yourself space to fail. Like I've, I've interviewed for a lot of jobs I didn't get um, and it stinks and it feels bad and it feels like they're judging you as a person and that they're throwing you out with the garbage because they didn't like you. Um, but just, you know, try and get to a place where you're like, I wasn't a good fit for them right now. That doesn't mean that I'm bad. It means that we wouldn't like work well together. Um, yeah. Oh. Uh, Mohammed says job seeking is impossible in third world countries. I 
Yeah, I don't know that struggle at all, but it sounds really hard. Finding data science jobs. Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, I'm afraid I don't have any really... Yeah, a lot of my advice, like, oh, meetups, oh, tech talks, are definitely more uh, developed world, sort of America-centric kind of, piece of pieces of advice. Um, yeah, I'm thinking if anyone has, has told me something that would be would be helpful in this in the situation. I don't really know anything off the top of my head. Yeah. Uh, Deepu says, which among R Python can improve the most in three years from now? That's a really good question. So I have complete faith in the R community to keep putting out packages that are um, solving data science specific needs. Um, it's just like, like this, this, this is an R package, by the way, uh, to just like be polite with your web scraping is so great. And like, I want to make sure I'm not crashing websites. And this is a very nice way to, to do that. Um, R core, I don't know of major changes, but the community is so strong that I'm not too worried. Um, so I think R has a very good trajectory is where I'm going with that. Python? So the Python community is super um, siloed and there's like, you know, lots of lots of little little communities. Like there's the Django community, there's the Flask community, there's the data science community off in its little, little land in the bottom. Um, but uh, Guido Van Rossum, who for all intents and purposes was running the Python language for a while, just stepped down from that sort of leadership position. So the direction that Python is going to be in, I know that right now the Python core developers are sprinting, um, but it's just sort of like, eh, question mark, question mark, question mark. Um, I think Python has a great trajectory. I'm complete faith that the language is going to continue to be um, very usable and delightful. Um, I don't know which is going to improve more. Both of them. How's that for an answer? Uh, Alexandra says, uh, it's hard finding a job in Haiti, just to let you know that there is worse in life. Ugh. Yeah. Yeah, I wonder... Hmm. I'm trying to think of... Um, I don't know what sort of, like, local jobs there are, um... But it might be worthwhile for uh, me at some point to pull together a list of resources for people who are um, working remotely and maybe doing sort of freelance work. Um, obviously, it's great to have a salary, and I am 100% in, in favor of people finding full-time jobs if that's what they want. Uh, but freelance work can be a nice way to sort of showcase your skills uh, and is a little bit easier to do remotely as well. So that might be, that might be an avenue. But yeah, I don't know y'all struggle and it sounds real rough, real rough. So, all right. Well, it is five and that's, it's a little bit of a downer, but I believe in you guys. I think you're all going to, we're all going to grow as data scientists and uh, improve our technical abilities and make friends and build networks and uh, hopefully get everybody hired. <laughs> that's the end goal. All right, and I won't be here next week. I'm going to be out of town. Um, yes, I am going to be out of town. Sorry, for a moment I was like, wait, is this the week that I think it is? Uh, but I will be back the week after. And I am thinking my plan is to start doing a series of me revamping my data science portfolio live. Uh, so I'll think a little bit about what that would look like. And that I'm going to have to plan a little bit more about what the content is going to look like. Yeah, look out for that in two weeks. Uh, thank you so much for joining me. I hope, oh, let me, let me quickly make this, there we go, uh, make this public. Oh, I actually had a really good example uh, for using a technique in a new way. So I know I'm a little bit all over this place. Uh, it is Lego topic modeling. Um, so there was this really cool project that 
uh, here we go, uh, I really liked where they used topic modeling, which is an NLP technique, to figure out which Lego sets were like each other, but instead of words, they used colors, uh, which I think is just such a neat application. And I think this is a fantastic portfolio project. Um, I don't hire people, but if I were hiring people and I saw this project, I would be pretty impressed. Uh, yeah, so that's a, that's a nice example. Uh, and let me uh, really quickly commit, which should take zero time and make this public so you guys can uh, check it out. And public, there we go. All right, thanks so much for joining me. I will be back in two weeks and I will talk to you guys then. Um, I'm gonna leave as soon as I find the window with my streaming. There we go, bye-bye. Uh,